gentlemen and uh, anybody who is undecided. <laughs> this is the second night of our last, our autumn production of this year, uh, Oscar Wilde's An Ideal Husband. And now, I, I won't spoil your entertainment with, uh, with a long speech, but there are just a couple of announcements. Uh, firstly, please, can I remind you to switch off your mobile phones, uh, iPads, whatever it may be. Please keep the ferrets in your pocket quiet. The uh, other announcement uh, is that there will be, as usual, an interval. We have an interval between Act 2 and Act 3. The interval will be 15 minutes. Uh, if you could please manage to return to your places fairly promptly, uh, we would all appreciate it. Uh, it is a long play, um, and uh, we do all want to get home tonight. <laughs> okay, um, finally, um, we hope you enjoy the play. If anybody would like to become involved with the Sensibles, having seen the play and the group, uh, please feel free to contact any member of the group after the show. Um, or turn to me to contact us. Our details are in the program. Uh, we would love to have you on board, and of course, we'd love to have even bigger audiences next time. So please bring more friends to the next production. Okay, without uh, further ado, an ideal husband. Do you? 
You are a very charming young lady. How sweet of you to say so. Do visit us more often. You know, we're always on Wednesdays. I never go anywhere nowadays. Sick of London society. Wouldn't mind being introduced to my tailor. At least he votes for the right side. While I object strongly to being sent down to dinner with my wife's milliner, never could stand Lady Cavendish's bonnets. Oh, I love London society. I think it has improved immensely. It is entirely made up now out of beautiful idiots and brilliant lunatics. Just what society should be. And Lord Goring, what is he? A beautiful idiot or the other thing? <laughs> I have been obliged at present to put Lord Goring into a class quite by herself. But he's developing charm. Ah, but into what? I hope to let you know very soon, Lord Caversham. Oh. <laughs> Lady Marby. Mm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Cheeley. What do you think, dear Gertrude? <laughs> so kind of you to let me bring my friend, Mrs. Cheeley, to such charming nature. <laughs> I think Mrs. Cheveley and I have met before. I did not know she had married a second time. Uh, people marry as often as they can nowadays. <laughs> it's most fashionable. <laughs> have we really met before Lady Chilton? I can't remember where. I've been out of England so long. We were at school together, Mrs. Cheveley. Indeed. I have a distinct recollection that we were in school together and that they were detestable. I am not surprised. I'm quite looking forward to meeting a clever husband. Since he's been at the foreign office, he's been so much talked about in Vienna. They even succeed in spelling his name right in the newspapers. That in itself is fame on the continent. I hardly think there will be much in common between you and my husband, Mrs. Cheveley. Good evening, Lady Markby. I hope you have brought Sir John with you. I have brought a much more charming person than Sir John. Sir John's temper, since he has seriously taken to politics, has become quite unbearable. This House of Commons, now that it is trying to become useful, really does a great deal of <coughs> Oh, I hope not, Lady Markby. But who is this charming person you have been kind enough to bring to us? Her name is Chibley. One of the doors at she at Chibley's, I suppose. Uh, but I don't quite know. Families are so mixed nowadays. You know, everybody turns out to be somebody else. <laughs> Mrs. Cheveley, I seem to know the name. Yes, she's just arrived from Vienna. And you know, she goes everywhere there. And she has such pleasant scandals about all her friends. I barely must go to Vienna next winter. I hope they have a good chef at the embassy. If there's not, Lady Barkby, the ambassador will certainly have to be withdrawn. I would like to meet that Mrs. Cheveley. Uh, my dear, may I introduce you? Sir Robert Chilton is dying to know you. Lord Cavershire. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is dying to know the brilliant Mrs. Cheveley. Our attaches at Vienna talk about, about nothing else. Thank you, Sir Robert. An acquaintance that begins with a compliment is sure to turn, to turn into a real friendship. <laughs> Fine, and an old lady, children already. Really? Yes. She has reminded me that we were in school together. I remember it perfectly now. She was always the one to win the good conduct prize. I have a distinct recollection that Lady Children always won the good conduct prize. And what prizes did you get, Mrs. Chiefly? My prizes came a little later on in life, but I don't think any of them were good conduct. I forget. I'm sure they were something charming. I don't know that women are always rewarded for being charming. At any rate, may I know what makes you leave your brilliant Vienna for a gloomy London? Or perhaps the question is indiscreet. <laughs> Questions are never indiscreet, Sir Robert, but answers sometimes are. 
Well, at any rate, may I know if it's politics or pleasure? Politics are my only pleasure. Now, it is not fashionable to flirt until one is 40. So we poor women who are 30 and below, or say we are, have nothing open to us but philanthropy and politics. And philanthropy is simply the refuge of people wanting to annoy their fellow creatures. I prefer politics. A political life is a noble career. Sometimes, Sir Robert, and sometimes it's a clutter game. And sometimes it's a great nuisance. Which do you find it? I? Accommodation of all three. Allow me. <coughs> Madam, I have not answered my questions yet. Um, what makes you leave on a uh, yeah, uh, on a London so suddenly? Our season's almost over. Oh, I don't care about the London season. It's too matrimonial. People are either hunting for husbands or hiding from them. <laughs> My stay in England really depends on you, and I wanted to meet you, Sir Robert. You know what a woman's curiosity is. Sometimes it's greater than a man's. I wanted immensely to meet you and to ask you to do something for me. I hope it's not a little thing. I find these little things are so difficult to do. Oh no, I don't think it is quite such a little thing. I'm so glad. Do tell me what it is. Later on. And now I'd like to have a tour of this beautiful house. I hear you have some charming pictures. Poor Baron Arnheim. You remember the Baron? He used to tell me you have some wonderful tarot. Did you know Baron Arnheim well? Intimately. Did you? At one time, yes. Wonderful man, wasn't he? He was remarkable in many ways. I often think of such a pity he didn't write his memoirs. They would have been most interesting. <coughs> Lord Goring. Ah, good evening, my dear Arthur. Mrs. Cheney, please allow me to introduce you to Lord Goring, the idlest man in London. I have met Lord Goring before. Oh, I did not think you would remember me, Mrs. Cheney. My memory is under admirable control. And are you still a bachelor? Oh, I believe so. Oh, may I ask, are you in London long? Well, that partly depends on the weather. Partly on the cooking and partly on Sir Robert. You're very late. Have you missed me? Awfully. Oh, then I'm sorry I didn't stay out longer. I love being missed. Oh, so much of you. <laughs> well, I'm very sorry. You're always telling me of your bad qualities, Lord Goring. I've only told you of the half of them as yet. Are the others very bad? Oh, quite dreadful. When I think of them at night, I I go to sleep at once. Well, I delight in your bad qualities. I wouldn't want you to part with any of them. Well, that's very nice of you to say. But then you are always very nice. By the way, did you see who uh, brought Mrs. Chee, that woman who went out with your brother? I think Lady Markby brought her. Why do you ask? I haven't seen her for years, that is all. What sort of a woman is she? A genius in the daytime and a beauty at night. I dislike her already. Well, that shows your admirable good taste. Aren't you coming to the music room? Well, not if there's any music going on, Miss Mabel. The music isn't German. You would not understand it. <laughs> what are you doing here? Wasting your time as usual. You should be in bed. I hear you keep very bad hours up until four o'clock in the morning dancing at Mrs. Rufford's. Only a quarter to four, Pilot. I don't see what you see in London society. Gone to the dogs, if you ask me. A lot of absolute damn nobody's talking about nothing. Oh, well, I like talking about nothing, Pilot. It's the only thing I know anything about. <laughs> it seems to me that you would appear to be living your life entirely for pleasure. Mm. What else is there to live for, Father? Nothing ages like happiness. You're heartless, sir. Very, very heartless. 
I hope not, but uh, good evening, Lady Basildon. I had no idea you ever came to political parties. Oh, I adore political parties. They're the only place left to us where people don't talk politics. I delight in talking politics. I talk them all day long. But I don't feel listening to them. I don't understand how the unfortunate men in the House of Commons stand these long debates. I never listen. Oh, really? Yes, yes, it is a very dangerous thing to listen. For if one listens, one is apt to be convinced, and a man who allows himself to be convinced by an argument is a thoroughly unreasonable person. Ah, that accounts for so much in men that I have never understood, and so much in women that their husbands and don't understand in them. Our husbands never appreciate anything in us. We have to go to others for that. Yes, always to others, have we not? <laughs> and those are the views of the two ladies who are known to have the most admirable husbands in London. That is exactly what we can't stand. My regiment is quite hopelessly faultless. There is not the smallest element of excitement in knowing him. Basilton is quite as bad. He is as domestic as if he was a bachelor. <coughs> My poor Olivia. We have married perfect husbands, and we are well punished for it. <laughs> I should have thought it was the husbands who were punished. Oh dear, no. They are as happy as possible. It is tragic how much they trust us. Perfectly tragic. Or well, comic, Lady Basildon. Certainly not comic, Lord Gorey. How unkind of you to suggest such a thing. I'm afraid Lord Gorey is in the camp of the enemy, as usual. I saw him talking to that Mrs. Cheveley when he came in. Handsome woman, that Mrs. Cheveley. Please don't praise other women in our presence. You might wait for us to do that. I did wait. Well, we are not going to praise her. She went to the opera on Monday night and told Tommy Ruffert at supper that London society was entirely made up of dowdies and dandies. Well, the men are all dowdies and the women all dandies, are they not? Oh, do you really think that is what Mrs. Cheveley meant? Absolutely, and a thoroughly sensible remark from Mrs. Cheveley to him now. What are you talking about, Mrs. Cheveley? Everyone's talking about Mrs. Cheveley. Lord Goring said, what did you say, Lord Goring, about Mrs. Cheveley? That she was beauty in the daytime and a genius at night? Oh, it was a nation. So very unnatural. <laughs> I like looking at geniuses and listening to beautiful people. How morbid of you to say such a thing, Mrs. Marchman? Would it be morbid to have a desire for food? Lord Goring. I have a great desire for food. Will you get me some supper? With pleasure, Miss Mayor. How horrid you have been. You never talked to me the whole evening. Well, how could I? You, you marched off to German music. You might have followed me. Pursuit would only have been polite. I don't think I like you at all this evening. And I like you immensely. Well, I wish you'd show it in a more marked way. Olivia, I have a curious feeling of absolute faintness. I think I should like some supper very much. I'm positively dying for supper. Men are so horribly selfish. They never think of these things. Men are grossly material. Grossly material. <laughs> and are you going to any of our country houses before you leave England, Mrs. Steepley? Oh, no, I can't stand English house parties. In England, people actually try to be brilliant at breakfast, and I find that so dreadful of them. Only dull people are brilliant at breakfast. My staying in England really depends on you, Sir Robert. Seriously? Quite seriously. I want to talk to you about a great political and financial scheme. The Argentine Canal Company, in fact. What a tedious and practical subject for you to talk about, Mrs. Chiefly. Well, I like <coughs> tedious, practical subjects. 
What I don't like are tedious, practical people. Besides, I know that you're interested in international canal schemes. You were Lord Radley's secretary when the government fought the Suez Canal shares. But the Suez Canal was a great and splendid undertaking. It gave us our direct route to India. It had imperial value. It was necessary that we should have control. This arch of high canal scheme is a commonplace stock exchange swindle. A speculation, Sir Robert. A brilliant, daring speculation. It is a swindle, Mrs. Chidi. Let us call things by their proper names. It makes life simpler. We have all the information about it at the Foreign Office. I sent out a special commission to inquire into the whole matter privately. And they report that the works are hardly begun. And as for the money subscribed to it, no one seems to know what has become of it. The whole thing is like a second Panama, but not with a quarter of the chance of success that miserable affair ever had. I hope you have not invested in it. I'm sure you're far too clever to have done that. I have invested very largely in it. Who could have advised you to do such a foolish thing? Your old friend in mine. Who? Baron Arnheim. Yes, I remember hearing at the time of his death that he had been mixed up in the whole affair. It was his last romance. His last but one to do him justice. Uh, but you have not seen my droves yet there in the music room. May I show them to you? I am not in the mood tonight for silver twilights or rose pink dawns. I want to speak business. I fear I have no advice to give you, Mrs. Chiefly, except to interest yourself in something less dangerous. The success of the canal depends, of course, on the attitude of England, and uh, I am going to lay the report before the House of Commons tomorrow night. That you must not do, Sir Robert, in your own interests. To say nothing of mine, that you must not do. In my own interest, my dear Mrs. Chiefly, what do you mean? My dear Sir Robert, I will be quite frank with you. I want you to suppress that report on the grounds that you have reasons to believe that the commissioners have been prejudiced or misinformed or something. Then I want you to say a few words to the effect that the government is going to reconsider the question. And you have reasons to believe that the canal, if completed, will be of great international value. You know, the sort of things ministers say in these types of cases. A few ordinary platitudes will do. In modern life, nothing produces such a good effect as a platitude. It makes the whole world kin. Will you do that for me? Mrs. Chidley, you cannot be serious in making me such a proposition. I am quite serious. Please allow me to believe that you are not. Ah, but I am. And if you do as I ask you, I will pay you very handsomely. Pay me? Yes. I'm afraid I don't quite understand what you mean. How very disappointing. And I came all the way from Vienna in order they should thoroughly understand me. I fear I don't. My dear Sir Robert, you are a man of the world and you have your price too, I suppose. Everyone does nowadays. The downfall is that most people are so dreadfully expensive. I know I am. I hope you'll be more reasonable with your terms. Please allow me to call your carriage for you, Mrs. Cheveley. You have lived so long abroad that you seem to be unable to realize that you're talking to an English gentleman. I realize I'm speaking to a man that laid the foundation of his fortune by selling a cabinet secret to a speculator. What do you mean? I mean, I know the true origin of your wealth and career, and I have got the letter too. What letter? The letter you wrote to Baron Arnheim when you were Lord Radley's secretary, telling the Baron to buy Suez Canal shares. A letter written three days before the government announced its own purchase. It is not true. You thought that the letter had been destroyed. How foolish of you. <coughs> I have got it in my possession. The affair to which you allude was no more than a speculation. The House of Commons had not yet passed the bill. It might have been rejected. It was a swindle, Sir Robert. Let us call things by their proper names. 
And now, I am going to sell you the letter. And the price that I ask for it is your public support in the Argentine scheme. You made your fortune out of one canal. Now you have to help my friends and I make a fortune out of another. It is infamous what you propose. Infamous. Oh no, my dear Sir Robert. This is the game called life. And we all have to play it. Sooner or later. I cannot do what you ask me. You mean you cannot do the help in doing it, Sir Robert? You know that you're standing on the edge of a precipice. It isn't for you to make terms, it is for you to accept them. Supposing you refuse. What then? Then, my dear Sir Robert, you were ruined, that is all. With our modern mania of morality, we must all pose as a paragon of purity and incorruptibility and all the other deadly seven virtues. And what is the result? You all go down like nine pins, one after the other. Now the year passes in England without someone going to disappear. Scandals used to lend fame, or at least interest, to a man. Now they only crush him. And yours is a very nasty scandal. You would never survive it. If it were known as a young man, secretary to a great and important minister, that you sold a cabinet secret for a large sum of money, and that was the foundation of your fortune, you would be hounded out of public life. My dear Sir Robert, why sacrifice your entire future rather than deal diplomatically with your enemy? You know, I haven't talked morality to you yet. You have to be honest and fair that I have spared you that. Several years you did a clever, unscrupulous thing. You owe it to your fame and position. And now you have to pay for it. Sooner or later, we all have to pay for what we do. You have to pay now. I want you to promise me that tonight you will lay down, suppress that report, and speak in part in favor of the idea. What you ask is impossible. You must make it possible, Sir Robert. You will make it possible. My dear Sir Robert, you know what your English newspapers are like. Supposing I leave here tonight and I drive to the nearest newspaper office and I give them this scandal and the proofs of it. Think of their loathsome of joy they would have and the delight in bringing you down through the mud and the mire that they would drag you through. Think of the hypocrite with his greasy smile penning his in the article and arranging the balance of his public card. Stop! You want me to withdraw the report and make a short speech saying that I believe that there might be possibilities in the scheme? <coughs> Those are my terms. <coughs> I can give you any sum of money you want. My dear Sir Robert, even you are not rich enough to pay back your past. No man is. I will not do what you ask me. You have to. If you don't... Wait. What did you propose? You said you would give me back my letter, didn't you? That is agreed. I will be in the ladies' gallery tomorrow night at half past eleven. If by that time, and you have heaps of opportunity, you have made a speech in the terms that I wish, I will give you back the letter with the prettiest thanks. I intend to play quite fairly. One should always play fairly when one has the wedding cards. The barons taught me that, amongst other things. You must let me have time to consider your proposal. No, we must settle now. Give me a week. Three days! Impossible! I've got to telegraph to Vienna tonight. My God, what brought you into my life? Circumstances! Wait, don't go. I consent the report shall be withdrawn. Thank you. I knew we'd come to an amicable agreement. I understood it from your nature at first. And now, Sir Robert, you call that carriage for me. I see the people coming up from supper. An Englishman tends to get so romantic after a meal, and that bores me dreadfully. <coughs> My dear Mrs. T, have you enjoyed yourself? Sir Robert is very entertaining, is he not? Most entertaining. I have enjoyed my evening immensely. You know, he has had a very interesting and brilliant career. And he has married the most admirable wife, Lady Chilton, 
is a woman of the very highest principles, I'm glad to say. Now, uh, I am a little too old myself to trouble about setting a good example, but I always admire those who And Lady Chilton has a very ennobling effect on life, though uh, her dinner parties are rather dull sometimes, but one can't have everything, can you? Now I must go. Shall I call for you tomorrow? We might drive in the park at five. Everything is so fresh in the park now, except the people. And perhaps the people are a little jaded. You know, as the season goes on, uh, there's something like uh, uh, loss of brains. <laughs> You know, anything is better than high intellectual pressure. <coughs> There's nothing more unbecoming than that. It makes the noses of the young girls so particularly large. And there is nothing, nothing so hard to marry as a large nose. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, Gertrude. Lord Shepherdshire. <coughs> I have had a delightful evening, Lady Children, in your house is charming, and I've had the most interesting conversation with your husband. Oh, I think you wish to meet my husband last <coughs> I wanted to interest him in the Suez or at, rather the Argentine Canal scheme, and I found him most susceptible. Susceptible to reason, I mean. I was able to convert him in 10 minutes. He's going to make a speech tomorrow night in favor of the idea. We should go to the ladies' gallery and hear him. It will be a great occasion. There must be some mistake. Is he bringing a man my husband's support? I assure you, it's all settled. And now, I don't regret my tedious journey from Vienna anymore. It's been a great success. But of course, for the next 24 hours, it will be a dead secret. A dead secret? Between who? Between your husband and myself. Your carriage is waiting, Mrs. Chiefly. Good evening, Lady Chilton. Good night, Lord Doring. You will see me down, Sir Robert, won't you? Now that we both have the same interests at heart, we will be great friends, I hope. What a hard woman. You should go to bed. <laughs> my father gave me advice an hour ago. I don't see why I shouldn't pass on the advice to you. I always pass on good advice to anything one can do with it. It's never of any use to oneself. You're always ordering me out of the room. I'm not going to bed for hours. You can sit down if you like and talk about anything in the world. Not only Scotch Diamond, the Royal Oak, and Mrs. Chief. Then I'm going to Dr. Diamond Brush. Quite beautiful, isn't it? I wish it were mine. Gertrude won't let me wear anything but pearls and make one look so good, so plain, and so intellectual. I wonder what it belongs to. Yes, I wonder who dropped it. It's a beautiful brooch. Yes, it's a handsome brace. It's a brooch, not a bracelet. It can be used as a bracelet. What are you doing? I'm going to make you a rather strange request, Miss Mabel. Oh, please do. <coughs> I'm waiting for it all the evening. Uh, I'm going to ask you not to tell anybody that I've taken charge of this brooch, and if anybody comes looking for it, let me know at once. That is a strange request. Yes, I gave this brooch to somebody years ago. You did? Yes. Well, then I shall certainly bid you good night. Good night, dear. You saw him at Martin Rogers, right? Yes, it's an unpleasant surprise. Why did she come? Apparently to try and do a robot, you've called some fraudulent scheme in which she's interested. The 
Mistaken her manner, hasn't she? She's incapable of understanding an upright nature like my husband's. Yes, I imagine she came to trouble if she tried to employ Robert in her plans. It's astounding what, what amazing mistakes clever women can make. I don't call women of this kind of point, I call them stupid. Same thing often. Good night, David. <laughs> My dear Arthur, you're not going. Do stay a little. Oh, I'm afraid I can't. Thanks very much. I promised to look into the heart blocks. Apparently they've got a move Hungarian band playing move Hungarian music. See you later. Goodbye. <laughs> How beautiful it is tonight, Gertrude. Robert, it's not true, is it? You're not going to lend your support to this art and speculation. You couldn't. I was probably intended to do so. The woman who was just going to have Mrs. Chibri, as she calls herself now, she seems to calm me a little bit. Robert, I know this woman. You don't. We were at school together. She was untruthful, dishonest, and an evil influence on everyone who stressed her friendship she could win. I hated her. I despised her. She stole things. She was sent away for being a thief. Why do you let her influence you? Gertrude, what you tell me may be true, but it happened many years ago. It is best forgotten. Mrs. Cheapley may have changed since then. No one should be entirely judged by their past. One's past is what one is. It's the only way by which people should be judged. That's a hard saying, Gertrude. It's a true saying, Robert. And what did you mean by those things that she had had you to lend her support in your name? The thing that you described as the most dishonorable thing there has ever been. <coughs> I was mistaken in the view I took. We all may make mistakes. But you told me only yesterday that you had received a report from the commission and that it entirely condemned the whole thing. I have reasons now to believe that the commissioners were prejudiced, or at any rate misinformed. Besides, public and private lives are different things. They have different laws and rules on different lines. I see no difference between them. In the present case, in a matter of practical politics, I have changed my mind. That is all. Oh? Yes. Robert, it is horrible that I have to, shut, that I have to ask you such a question, but, but are you telling me the whole truth? Why do you ask me such a question? Why do you not answer it? Gertrude, truth is a very complex thing. <laughs> And politics are very complex business. There are weirds within weirds, and one may be under certain obligations to people who must pay. Sooner or later in political life, we all have to compromise. Everyone does. Compromise? Robert, why do you talk so differently from life in the way I've said you talk? Why have you changed? Not changed. The circumstances alter things. The circumstances should never alter principles. But if I told you, what? That it was necessary, vitally necessary. It can never be necessary to do what's not honorable. But it's not necessary, Robert. Tell me it's not. Why should it be? What gain would you get? Money? We have no need of that. The power? The power is nothing in itself. It is the power to do good that is mine. So what is it then, Robert? Tell me, why are you going to do this dishonorable thing? Gertrude, you have no right to use that word. I told you, it was a matter of rational compromise. Robert, that is all very well for other men. For men, you treat life simply as a slight, as a slight speculation, but <coughs> not for you. Because you are different. For all your life you stood apart from others. You've never let the world soil you. To the world, as to myself, you've been an ideal, always. Oh, be that ideal still. Don't kill my love for you. Don't kill that. Gertrude. I know that there are men with horrible secrets. Men who have done something shameful and who have to pay for it by being <coughs> my rector's shame. You don't tell me you're such as they are. Robert, is there in your life any secret dishonor or disgrace? Tell me, tell me at once. <coughs> that what? that a life may drift apart. Drift apart? That you might be entirely separate. It would be better for us both. Gertrude, 
There is nothing in my past life that you may not know. Robert, I was sure of it. Why did you say those dreadful things so unlike your real self? But let's ever talk about the subject again. You will write to Mrs. Chief, won't you? Tell her that you cannot support a scandalous deal of hers. Must I write and tell her that? Yes, surely, Robert. What else is there to do? I might go and see her personally. That might be better. She must never see her again. She's not a woman you should ever speak to. She's not worthy to talk to a man like you. No, you must write to her once. Now, at this moment, and let your letter show her that your decision is quite horrible. Right this moment? Yes. <laughs> But it's almost it's 12. That makes no matter. She must know at once that she has been mistaken in you and for nothing. <coughs> Anything is not Right? But you decline to support a scheme of hers. As you hold it to be a um, dishonest. You must write the word dishonest. She knows what the word means. <laughs> Put out the lights, Mason. Put out the lights. <coughs> Nothing could make all her abuse. Well, I'm bound to say you should have told her long ago. When? When we were engaged? Do you think she would have married me if she had known the origin of her fortune, the basis of her <coughs> career? And that I did a thing that most men would call shameful and dishonorable? Yes, I suppose most men would call it ugly. Men, men who every day do something of the same kind themselves. Men who each one of them have worse secrets in their own lives. Well, that's why they're so pleased to find secrets in others. It takes public attention away from their so And I brought whom did I wrong with what I did? No one. Except yourself, Robert. Of course I had private information about the search transaction contemplated by the government of that day, and I acted on it. Private information is practically the source of every large modern fortune. And 
public scandal is very easy to resolve. Do you think it's fair that what it did nearly 18 years ago should be brought up against me now? A man's whole career ruined for a fall, done almost in boyhood. I was 22 at that time, and I had the double misfortune of being well born and poor. Do you think it's fair that this folly, this sin of one's youth should wreck a life like mine, should shatter all that I've worked for and all that I've built up? Is it fair, Arthur? And life is never fair, Robert. And perhaps it's a good thing for many of us that it's not. Every man of ambition has to fight his century with its own weapons. What this century worships is wealth. The god of this century is wealth. To succeed, one must have wealth. At all costs, one must have wealth. Robert, believe me, you underestimate yourself. You could have succeeded just as well without one. When I was old, perhaps, when I was tired, worn out, when I had lost my passion for power, I wanted my success when I was young. I couldn't wait. <laughs> You certainly got it when you were young. I'm the Secretary of Foreign Affairs at Foley. That should be good enough for anybody, I don't think. And if it is all taken away from me now, if I lose everything over a horrible scandal. Robert, what could bring you to sell yourself for money? I did not sell myself for money. I bought success at a great price. Yes, you certainly paid a great price for it. But what made you think of doing such a thing in the first place? Baron Arnheim. Damn it, scoundrel. No, he, he was a man of culture and charm. One of the most intellectual men I ever met. I prefer a gentlemanly fool any day. There's a lot to be said for stupidity that people don't give credit for. Personally, I've got a great admiration for stupidity. Sort of a fellow feeling, I understand. But, um, how, uh, how did he bring you to it? Tell me the whole story. One night after dinner at Lord Redley's, the Baron began talking about success in modern life. With that fascinating voice of his, he expounded to us the most terrible philosophy of power, preached to us the most marvelous gospel of gold. Later, he wrote me and asked me to come and see him. I remember he led me through his picture gallery, showed me his Jews made me wonder at the very luxury in which he lived. And then he told me that luxury was nothing but the background, a painted scene in a play, and that power, power over other men, was the one thing worth having. And that in our century, only the rich possessed it. A shallow, a thoroughly shallow creed. I didn't think so then. <coughs> I don't think so now. Wealth has given me enormous power. It gave me the very outset of my life, freedom. And freedom is everything. You have never been poor. You've never known what ambition is. You cannot understand what a wonderful chance the very gave me. Such a chance as few men ever get. <laughs> Luckily for them, if one is to judge by results. But uh, how did he actually bring you to do it? When uh, I went away, he said to me that if I ever had any information of real value, he would make me a very rich man. I was dazed by the prospect he had out of me that time, and my ambition and my desire for power were boundless. Six weeks later, certain private documents passed through my hands. State documents? Yes. Robert. You of all men in the world, I should have thought, wouldn't be so weak as to yield to such a temptation. Weak? Do you really think, Arthur, that it is weakness that yields to temptation? I tell you, there are terrible temptations out there that it requires strength, strength and courage to yield to. To stake all one's life on a single moment, to risk everything on one's throat. I had that courage. I sat down the same afternoon and wrote the Baron this letter this woman now holds. He made three quarters of a million in the transaction. And you? I received from the Baron 110,000 pounds. <coughs> Robert, you were worth more than that. <coughs> no. That money gave me exactly what I wanted. Power over others. I went into Parliament immediately. The Baron advised me in finance from time to time, and in five years, I had almost trebled my fortune. 
Since then, everything I have touched has turned out a success. It all seems connected with money. I've had a luck so <coughs> extraordinary that it has made me almost afraid. I remember having read in some strange book that if the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. Robert, did you know, never suffer any regret for what you have done? No. I thought I had fought this century with its own weapons and won. You thought you had won. Arthur, do you despise me for what I have just told you? I feel sorry for you, Robert. Terribly sorry. I don't say that I suffered any remorse. I didn't. But I have paid conscience money many times in the wild hope that I might be able to disarm destiny. The sum the Baron gave me I have distributed <coughs> twice over in public charities. Public charities? Good Lord, Robert, what a lot of harm you must have done. <laughs> don't say that, Arthur. Don't <coughs> talk like that. Sorry, don't listen to me. I'm always saying what I shouldn't say. In fact, I usually say what I really think. Great mistake, are they? <laughs> so liable to be misunderstood. As regards this dreadful business, Robert, I'll help you in whatever way I can. You know that. Thank you, Arthur. But what is to be done? What can be done? Well, the English, the English don't like a man who's always insisting he's in the right. But they do like a man who's prepared to admit he's in the wrong. However, in your case, Robert, uh, a confession would not do. Uh, the money, if you'll allow me to say so, uh, is awkward. And besides, if you did make a full confession, uh, You'd never be able to talk morality again. And in England, a man who can't talk morality at least twice a week to a large, popular, immoral crowd is quite finished as a politician. <laughs> There'd be nothing left for him in the career but botany. Or the, the church. Arthur, the only thing for me to do now is fight the thing out. I've been waiting for you to say that. The only thing left for you to do. And you must begin by telling your wife that. <coughs> That I will not do. Um, I could do it. It would kill her love for me. And this woman, Mrs. Cheveley, how can I defend myself against her? You knew her before, Arthur, apparently. Uh, yes. <laughs> Did you know her well? So little that I got engaged to be married to her at one stage. The affair lasted uh, three days, nearly. <laughs> Why it was broken off? Oh, I forget. At least it makes no matter. Have you tried her with money? She has to be so confoundedly fond of money. I offered her any sum she wanted. She refused. But the marvelous gospel of gold breaks down sometimes, eh? The rich can't do everything, it seems. <coughs> Not everything. I suppose you're right, Arthur. <coughs> Public disgrace is in store for me now. I feel certain of it. I never knew what terror was before, I know it now. It is as if a hand of ice were laid on one's heart. Come, Robert, you must fight her! Fight her! But how? I don't know. I have the slightest idea. And every one of us has our weakness. There's a flaw in each one of us. My father tells me that uh, even I have faults. Perhaps I do. In defending myself against Mrs. Cheveley, I have a right to use any weapon I can find, have I not? No, oh, I should say that in your position, I wouldn't have the slightest scruple in doing so. I shall send a telegram to the embassy at Vienna and inquire if there's anything known against her. There might be some secret scandal she might be afraid of. I should say that Mrs. Cheveley is one of those thoroughly modern women who is finds a scandal as becoming as a new bonnet and air both of them in the parks on Thursday evening. I should think she'd love scandals and the sorrow of her life at present is she doesn't get enough of them. Why do you say that? Well, she didn't wear... She wore far too much rouge yesterday evening and not quite enough clothes. Always a sign of desperation in the woman. <laughs> Tell Mr. Shepherd to have this sent off in cipher immediately. Yes, Sir Robert. <coughs> she must have had some curious hold over Baron Arnheim. I wonder what it was. Yes, I wonder. 
I will fight her to the death. As long as my wife knows nothing. <laughs> fight her in any case, Robert. There would be little left to fight for. I will fight her with her own weapon. It is just a chance, but I will leap in it. And she looks like a woman with a past, doesn't she? Most pretty women do, Robert. <laughs> Robert, I wouldn't put too much hope in, uh, in frightening Mrs. Cheatley. I don't think she's easily frightened. She, she shows a remar remarkable presence of mind. I live on hopes now. I clutch at every chance. I shall let you know as soon as I hear from Vienna. It is just a chance. Uh, good evening, <coughs> children. Have you been in the park? Well, I hope the Women's Liberal Association received your hat with loud applause, Lady Chilton. It is the prettiest bonnet I've ever seen. And it would be much more important work to do than another kind of bonnet, I'm sorry. Now I'd come in to have my tea. You will wait and have some, won't you? Oh, I'll wait a short while, thank you. Oh, we'll be back in a little You have been a good friend to me, Arthur. Thank you. No, I can't say that I've been able to do much for you as yet, Robert. In fact, I don't think I've been able to do a damn thing. I'm thoroughly disappointed with myself. You have enabled me to tell the truth. That is something. The truth has always stifled me. The truth is something I always get rid of at the earliest opportunity. <laughs> a bad mistake, by the way. It makes one very unpopular at the club. With the older members, they call it being conceited. Absolutely. I would to God that I had been able to live the truth. That is the greatest thing in life, to live the truth. Ah. I shall speak to you soon, shall I? Yes, certainly, yes. I'll, uh, I plan to look in at the bachelor's ball this evening, unless I can find something better to do. But I'll pop around tomorrow, tomorrow morning, and if you should need me beforehand, send a letter to Curtis on the street. Thank you. You're not going, Robert. Ah, I, I have some letters to write, dear. You're working hard. You seem never to think of this one. Were you looking it is nothing, dear. Nothing. Do sit down. I'm so glad you I wanted to talk to you about well, not about bonnets, but a women's liberal association. <coughs> you take far too much interest in the first subject and not nearly enough in the second. Do you want to talk to me about this, Mrs. Chief? You have guessed it. After she left last night, I found out that what she had said was really true. Of course I made Robert like her, write her letter at once for trying his promise. Yeah, so he gave me to understand. To have kept it would have been a first stain in a career that has always been stainless. Robert is a Bob approach. He is not my kind of man. He can't afford to do what other men do. Don't you agree with me? You're Robert, our greatest friend. No one except myself knows Robert better than you do. He has no secrets from me, and I, I don't think he has any from you. Oh, he has none from me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so don't think he has. Oh. Well, then I might not write my estimate to him. Well, I know what he'd write. But you speak to me frankly. Quite frankly. You have nothing to conceal, have you? Well, no, Lady Children, but, uh, <clears throat> but sometimes I think in, uh, in public life there is there's always something. Yep. Yes? <laughs> There's something about public life that always makes a man unscrupulous. Once he has set his sights on a certain point, he has to climb up a crag to get there. He climbs up a crag. He has to crawl through the mire. Well. <laughs> crawl through the mire. Of course, I'm only speaking generally about life. I hope so. <laughs> Why do you look at me so strange, Lord Corey? <laughs> But Lady Shelton, I, I sometimes believe that, uh, well, right, I sometimes think that you're, you're a little harsh in some of your views on life. I think sometimes you don't make sufficient allowance. Supposing any public figure, Lord Merton, or, or my father, say, or, or Robert, should uh, in his uh, youth have sent a foolish letter to somebody. What do you mean by a foolish letter? A letter gravely compromising one's position. Robert is as incapable of doing a foolish thing as he is of doing a wrong thing. 
Nobody is incapable of doing it foolish. Nobody is incapable of doing it wrong. Are you a pessimist? What will the other dandies say? They will all have to go into mourning. No, Lady Children, I'm not a pessimist. In fact, I don't really know what the word means. All I do know is that life cannot be lived, cannot be understood without great charity. It is love, not, not German philosophy, that is the true explanation of this world, whatever the explanation of the next is. And if you are ever in trouble, then come to me for my assistance and you shall have it. If you are ever in trouble, then trust in me absolutely, and come at once to me. Lord Horing, you are talking quite seriously. I don't think I've ever heard you talk seriously before. You must excuse me. I shall try to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, are you serious? <laughs> oh, dear Gertrude, don't say such a dreadful thing to Lord Goring. Seriousness would be very unbecoming here. Please, Lord Goring, be as trivial as you can. I should like to be at Miss Mabel, but I find I'm a little out of practice this morning. And besides, I must be going. Just what I've come in? What dreadful manners you have. I'm sure you're very badly brought up. Oh, I was. I was shy it brought you up. <coughs> I'm so sorry you did. Well, it's too late now, I suppose. Oh, I'm not so sure. Will you arrive tomorrow morning? Yes, it sounds. Don't forget. Uh, no, of course I shan't. Oh, by the way, let uh, Lady Children, there's no mention of your uh, list of guests in the morning post of today. It's apparently been crowded out by the city council or something equally for it. Could you let me have a copy of the list? I have a particular reason for asking. I'm sure Mr. Trevor will be able to get one. Thanks so much. Tommy Trefford is the most useful person in London. Oh. And who is the most ornamental? I am. <laughs> <laughs> How clever of you to have guessed. And uh, goodbye, Lady Children. You will remember what I told you, will you not? Yes, I don't know why you said this things to me. I hardly know myself. <coughs> goodbye, Miss Mabel. I wish you were not here. I've had four wonderful adventures this morning. Four and a half, to be exact. You might stay and listen to some of them. Well, how selfish of you to have had four and a half adventures. <coughs> there won't be any left for me. I don't want you to have any. They would not be good for you. Miss Mabel. That is the first unkind thing you've ever said to me. How charming will you accept it? Then tomorrow. And don't bring Tommy Trafford. Of course I shan't bring Tommy Trafford. Tommy Trafford is a great disgrace. I'm delighted to hear it. Hey, I wish that you would speak to Tommy Trafford. <coughs> what has poor Mr. Trafford done this time? Rather, says he's the best secretary he's ever had. Tommy has proposed to me again. Tommy really does nothing but propose to me. He proposed to me last night in the music room when I was quite unprotected. There was an elaborate trio going on. I didn't dare make the smallest repartee. He could have stopped the music at once. And then musical people are so absurdly unreasonable. They always want one to be perfectly dumb when one is longing to be absolutely deaf. And then today, he proposed to me in broad daylight in front of that dreadful statue of Achilles. <laughs> really, the things that go on in front of that work of art are quite appalling. The police should interfere. <laughs> and at luncheon, I saw by the glare in his eye that he was going to propose again. I was able to stop him in time by assuring him that I was a bimetallist. Fortunately, I don't know what bimetallism means, and I don't think anybody else does either. <coughs> but the observation crushed him on me. He was quite shocked. <coughs> really, I'm quite fond of Tommy, but his methods of proposing are quite out of date. If Tommy wants to be romantic, he talks to one just like a doctor. <laughs> really. He's quite annoying. I wish that you would speak to him, Gertrude, and tell him that once a week is quite often enough to propose to anyone, and that it should always be done in a manner that attracts some attention. Rather, it speaks very widely of Mr. Trafford. He believes there's a brilliant future before him. Well, I wouldn't want to marry a man with a future before him for anything in the world. Mabel? I know, dear. You married a man with a future before him, didn't you? But then, Robert was a genius, and you have a noble, self-sacrificing character. I have no character at all, and <laughs> Robert is the only genius I ever could bear. Geniuses talk so much, don't they? Such a bad habit. And they're always thinking about themselves when I want them to be thinking about me. <coughs> I have to go now and rehearse a big battle with them. Oh, Gertrude, the one was coming to see you. That dreadful Miss Cheebly. The Lady Marby. <coughs> Oh, I love 
Chilton, I presume? I found your frock quite charming last night. So simple and suitable. Really? I must tell my dressmaker. It would be such a surprise for her. Goodbye, Lady Markby. I have to stand on my head with some to go. Going already and standing on your head? Most unhealthy. Most unhealthy. You are remarkably modern, Mabel. A little too modern, perhaps. Uh, there's nothing more dangerous than being too modern. One is apt to grow old-fashioned quite suddenly. What a dreadful prospect. Uh, you need not be nervous. You will always be as pretty as possible. Thank you so much, Lady Murphy. Dear Gertrude, we've just called to see if Mrs. Cheveley's diamond brooch has been found. Here? Yeah. <coughs> yes, I missed it when I got back to Claridge's, and I thought I may have dropped it here. Oh, I have heard nothing about it. I was sent to the butler and ask. Oh, pray, don't trouble, Lady Chilton. I dare say that it was at the opera before we came out of here. Yes, I think it must have been at the opera. Fact is, we all scramble and jostle about so much nowadays that I wonder we have anything left at all on us at the end of it. <laughs> I know myself that when I come back from the drawing room, I always feel as if I hadn't a shred left. <laughs> Except perhaps for a small shred of decent reputation, just enough to prevent the lower classes from making painful observations through the windows of the carriage. What sort of a brooch was it that you lost, Mrs. Sheely? A diamond snake brooch with a ruby, and it had a rather large ruby. Has a ruby and diamond brooch been found in any of the rooms this morning, Mason? No, my lady. It really is of no inconvenience, Lady <coughs> Chilton. I hope I didn't put you through any <coughs> inconvenience. Uh, it has been no inconvenience. That will do, Mason. You can make tea. How is your husband, Lady Marbury? Uh, sadly degenerate. <laughs> this horrid house of commons quite ruins our husbands. <laughs> The greatest blow since the higher education of women. It is heresy to say it in this house, Lady Marquis. Crawford is a great champion of the higher education of women, and so am I. The higher education of men is what I'd like to see. Men need it so sadly. I think such a scheme would be quite unpractical. Men doesn't have much capacity for development. And men has got as far as he can, and that is not far, is it? <laughs> and modern women understand everything, I'm told. Except their husbands. And a good thing that is, it might break up many a happy home if they did. Not yours, of course, dear Gertrude. You married a pattern husband. I wish I could say that much for <coughs> myself. So see you, Thanks. Come to you, Lady Marjorie. No, thanks, dear. I have promised <coughs> to visit poor Lady Frankenstein, who is in very, very great trouble indeed. Her daughter has become engaged to a curate from Shropshire. Very sad, very sad indeed. I can't understand this modern mania with curates. In my time, we girls saw them, of course, running around the place like rabbits. But of course, we never took any notice of them. And the eldest son has borrowed with his father. And when they meet at the club, Lord Brancaster always hides himself behind the time. As a matter of fact, they have to take an extra and extra copies of the Times because there are so many sons who won't have anything to do with their fathers. And now I must go, dear. If you allow me to 
to leave Mrs. Cheveley in your charge. I'll pick her up in a quarter of an hour. Or perhaps, Mrs. Cheveley, you wouldn't mind waiting in the carriage for me while I am with Lady Brancaster. Since I intended to be a visit of a condolence, I shan't stay long. I hope Mrs. Cheveley will stay here so. I should like to have a few minutes conversation with her. How very <coughs> kind of you, Lady Chilton. Believe me, nothing would give me greater pleasure. Oh, yes, of course. You have plenty pleasant reminiscences of good old school days to talk over to me. My dear, if I encourage you. Oh, will I see you at Lady Bonard's tonight? Well, then I have only had one way of self tonight. I don't think I shall go into the office. Rather, of course, will have to be in the house. Dining at home by yourselves? Oh, I forgot. Your husband is an exception. Mine is the general rule. <laughs> uh, and nothing. Nothing ages a woman more rapidly than having married the general. <laughs> Wonderful woman, a lady Markaby, isn't she? Talks more and says less than anyone I've ever met. She was made for public speaking. Mrs. Cheveley, I think it is quite right to tell you that when I know who you really were, I should not have invited you to my house last night. Really? I could not have done so. I see that after all these years, you have not changed a bit. Gertrude, I never change. Then life has taught you nothing. It has taught me that a person who has once been guilty of a dishonest and dishonorable action may be guilty of it a second time and should be shunned. Would you apply that rule to everyone? Yes, to everyone, without exception. Well, then I feel truly sorry for you, Lady Chilton. Truly sorry. See, now I was sure that for many reasons, any further acquaintance between us is quite impossible. <coughs> You know, Gertrude, I don't mind you talking morality to me a bit. Morality is simply the attitude we adopt towards people we don't like. You don't like me, and I'm well aware of that. And I have always detested you. Yet I have come here to do you a service. <coughs> like a service you wish to render my husband last night, I suppose. But thank heaven I saved you from that. It was you who made him write that insolent letter to me? It was you who made him break his promise? Yes. Then you must make him keep it. I will give you till tomorrow morning. If by that time your husband doesn't solemnly bind himself to my great schemes. It's fraudulent speculation. Call it what you choose. I hold your husband in the hollow of my hands. And you would be wise into making him do as I say. You are impertinent. What has my husband to do with a woman like you? My dear Gertrude, in this world, life meets like. It's because your husband himself is fraudulent and dishonest that we pair together so well. Between you and him, there are chasms. He and I are more than just friends. We are enemies linked together. The same sin binds us. How how dare you class my husband with yourself? How dare you threaten him or me? Leave my house. You are unfit to enter it. Your house? A house paid for by my fraud? Ask him when the origin of his fortune is. Get him to tell you how he sold the cabinet secret to a speculator. That's not true. No, but it's not true. Look at him. Can he deny it? Does he dare to? No. Go at once, you have done your worst now. My worst? <coughs> I am not through with you yet, with either of you. I give you both till tomorrow afternoon. If you don't do as I bid, the whole world will know the origin of Sir Robert Chilton. <coughs> you sold a cabinet secret for money. You began your life with a fraud. You built your career on dishonor. Tell me it's not true. Lie to me. Tell me it's not true. What this woman said is quite true. 
back, listen to me, girl. But you don't realize how I was tempted. Let me tell you the whole thing. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I feel as if you've spoiled me forever. What mask you've been wearing all those years? Poor little painted mask. You sold yourself for money. You lied to the whole world. And you wouldn't have lied to me. Gertrude. Oh, how I worship you. You are so honest, noble, pure. And to think that I made a man like you my ideal. The ideal of my life. There was your mistake. Why could you not love me, falls and all? Why did you have to place me on a monstrous pedestal? Why could you not love me knowing my weaknesses? It is not the perfect, but the imperfect we need love. Love should forgive, else what use is love at all? And so, you <coughs> made your false idol of me, and I had not the courage to tell you. I was afraid that I might lose your love, just as I've lost it now. So, last night, you ruined my life for me. Yes, ruined it. What this woman asked of me was nothing compared to what she offered to me. She offered security. The sin of my youth that I thought was buried rose up hideous with its, with its hands at my throat. I could have killed it forever, destroyed its record. You prevented that. And now, what is there before me but public disgrace, ruin the mockery of the world? Make no more ideas of men, or you will ruin other people's lives with you. You, who I have so wildly loved, have ruined mine. I'm coming to you. Gertrude. I trust you, I need you, I'm coming to you. Oh, 
but she has found out everything. Poor woman. Oh, ten o'clock, what an hour to call. Well, I will make her stand by her husband. That is the only thing for her to do. Ten o'clock, she will make The Lord Kellershaw. Why will parents always turn up at the wrong moment? Some extraordinary mistake in nature, I suppose. I'm delighted to see you, Father. <laughs> Take my clothes off. Is it uh, worthwhile, Father? <laughs> of course it's worthwhile. <laughs> now, which is the most comfortable chair in the house? Uh, this one, Father. It is the chair I use myself when I have guests. <laughs> no drafts here, I trust. Can't stand drafts. No, Father. No drafts. Uh, you have many reasons, Father. What? I don't understand what you mean. Now, listen, I want to have a serious conversation with you. Oh, my dear Father, at this hour. But it's only 10 o'clock. What is your objection to the hour? Well, the thing is, Father, it's not my day for talking seriously. I'm, I'm very sorry, but it's not my day. What do you mean? I only talk seriously on the first Thursday of every, every month. <laughs> Four to seven. What? What? Make it a Thursday, make it a Thursday. Yes, Father, but it's, uh, it's after seven o'clock, and my, my doctor tells me I can't have serious conversation after seven. <laughs> Better talk in my sleep. Talk in your sleep? What's that got to do with it? You're not even married. And that's what I want to talk to you about. It's high time you got married, sir. When I was your age, I had already been an inconsolable widower for three months. <laughs> and I was already paying court to your admirable mother. Damn it, sir, it's your duty to get married. You can't go on living for pleasure all your life. Now, take your good friend Robert Chilton, for instance. Upstanding young man. Look where he's got through. Probity, hard work, and a sensible marriage to a young lady. Why don't you imitate him? No, I think I shall, Father. I wish you would. Make me a lot happier. The moment I'm making your mother's life a misery on your account. You're heartless, sir. Very heartless. Oh, I hope not, Father. It's high time you got married. You're 34 years of age. <coughs> yes, and I only admit 32. <laughs> 31, when I have a really good father. <laughs> Damn it, sir. It is your duty to get married. I tell you, you are 34. Two! Two! I'm two. Father, there's a draft in here which makes your conduct even more reprehensible. I feel it distinctly. So do I, Father. I'll come and see you during the week. We can, we can talk about anything you've done. Oh, no, no. I've come here for a definite purpose this evening, and I'm going to see it to the end, even at the risk of your health or mine. Put my cloak down. Certainly, Father, but uh, let us move it. <laughs> this room is a dreadful draft. Ah, Phyllis. Is there a fire in the smoke? I've just stuck it up, my lord. Come in there, Father. Your sneezes are quite hard. I think I may be allowed to sneeze where I please. Oh, <laughs> certainly, Father. I was merely expressing sympathy. Oh, damn sympathy. There's far too much of that going around these days. Oh, I agree entirely. There'll be less sympathy in the world, there'll be less trouble in the world. That is a paradox, and I hate paradoxes. So do I, Father. Everybody one meets nowadays is a paradox of you. Society so obvious. Such a bore. Do you really understand what you say half the time? <laughs> well, yes, but if I listen attentively. <laughs> you conceited young puppy. <laughs> Phyllis, there's a lady coming to see me this evening on particular business. Uh, show her into the drawing room as soon as she arrives. Is that clear? Yes. A matter of the utmost importance, Phyllis. I understand, mother. No one else must be admitted under any circumstances. I understand, Father. Ah, that'll be the lady now. Am I to wait on your convenience? Yes. Sorry, Father. I was momentarily blown back by the breeze. It's <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> quite boring out here. I was told he was at home. His Lordship is engaged at present with Lord Kevishan. He told me to ask you to be kind enough to wait from the drawing room. The drawing expects me? Yes, madam. Are you quite sure? His lordship told me that if a lady called her was to ask her to wait from the drawing room. His lordship's direction of the subject are very precise. Ah! How dreary a bachelor's drawing room always 
looks. I will have to alter this. I shall like some candles, madam. I wonder what woman Lord Goring is waiting for tonight. It will be a delight to catch him. What a very interesting room. I wonder what his correspondence is like. How uninteresting correspondence. Bills and, and letters. Whoever writes to him on pink paper looks like it's the beginning of a middle class romance. Romance should never begin with a sentiment. Wait a minute. I know this handwriting. Gertrude Chilton's. I remember it perfectly. The Ten Commandments in every stroke of the pen and the moral law written all <coughs> over the page. I wonder what she's writing to Lord Goring about. Well, there's something hard about me, I suppose. How oh, I detest that woman. <coughs> I trust you, I need you, I am coming to you, Gertrude. Yeah. I trust you, I need you, I am coming to you, Gertrude. The candles in the drawing room on it, madam. Thank you.
Arthur, tell me what I should do. My life seems to have crumbled about me. A ship without a brother and a night without a star. Robert? <coughs> Robert, you love your wife, don't you? I love her more than anything. I used to think ambition the great thing in the world. It is not. Love is the great thing in the world. There's nothing but love. And I love her. But I'm ignoble in her eyes. There's a white gulf between us now. She has stuck me out. Robert, has your wife never committed some act of indiscretion, some act of folly that she should be unable to forgive you your sin? My wife? Never. She does not know what weakness or temptation is. I am of clay like other men. She stands apart as good women do, pitiless in her perfection, cold and stern and without mercy. But I love her, and she has cut my heart in two. I was brutal to her this evening, but I suppose when sinners talk to saints, they are always brutal. I said things to her that were hideously true from my side, my perspective. But don't let us talk of that. Robert, <coughs> your wife will forgive you. Perhaps she is forgiving you at this very instant. She, she loves you, Robert. Why should she not forgive you? God grant it. <coughs> uh, there's something else I have to tell you. Okay, it's not, sir. Thank you. Uh, Robert, is your carriage here? Yeah? No. I uh, was from the club. Uh, Phipps, uh, Sir Robert will take my carriage. Yes. Robert, you don't mind me sending you away, do you? I think you must let me stay for five more minutes. I have made up my mind what I'm going to do tonight at Parliament. The debate on the arts of Tank and Mountain. This is within at 11 o'clock. What was that? Um, nothing. <laughs> I heard a chair fall in the other room. Someone has been listening. Uh, no, there's nobody there. Uh, there is someone. There are lights in the room and the doors are dark. Someone has been listening to every secret of my life. Arthur, what does it mean? Hey, come, Robert. You are excited. You're, you're nervous. Uh, come and sit down. I tell you, there is nobody there. Do you give me your word that there's no one? Yes. Your word of honor? Yes. <laughs> Let me see for myself. <laughs> there's no one there, why should I not look into that room? I think you must let me go into that room and for myself. Let me know that no eavesdrop has done my life a secret. I think you don't really like what I'm going through. Robert, this must stop. I've told you that there's nobody in that room. But that is enough. Come. It is not enough. <laughs> I insist on going into that room. You said there's no one there, so what reason can you have for refusing me? For God's sake, don't, Robert. There is somebody in that room, somebody you must not see. I thought so. I forbid you to go into that room. Stand back. My life is at stake. I don't care who it is. I will know to whom I have told my secret and my shame. Oh, for God's sake, his own wife. <laughs> what explanation can you give for the presence of that <coughs> woman here? Robert, I swear to you on, on my honor that that woman is stainless and guiltless of all offense towards you. <coughs> She's a vile, infamous thing. No, don't say such a thing, Robert. It's for your sake. <laughs> it's for your sake. She came here. She came here to save you. Robert, she loves you and nobody else. <laughs> you are mad. <laughs> what have I to do with her and treat with you? No. But let her remain your mistress. You are well suited no. to each other. She corrupt and shameful. You fought as a friend. Robert, before heaven, it's not true. In your presence and in hers, I'll explain all. Stand back. You have light enough upon your word of honor. <laughs> Good evening, Lord Goring. Mrs. Cheeky, great heavens. May I ask what you were doing in my drawing room? Merely listening. I have a perfect passion for listening to your keyholes. One hears the most interesting things through them. I'm glad you called. I'm going to give you a piece of good advice. Oh, no. Please don't. One should never give a woman anything she can't wear in the evening. <laughs> I see you are quite as willful as you always used to be. Far more. I have greatly improved. I have had much more experience. 
You have come here to sell me Robert Chilton's letter. To offer it to you on conditions. <coughs> Don't you guess that? Because you haven't mentioned the subject yet. Uh, have, you, uh, have you got it ready to go? Oh, no. A well-made dress never has any pockets. Well, what is your price, Lord? How absurdly English you are. The English always think that a checkbook could solve every problem in life. My dear Sir Arthur, I have much more money than you have, and just as much as Robert Chilton has gotten hold of. Money is not what I want. What do you want then, Mrs. Cheveley? Why don't you call me Laura? I don't like it. <laughs> you used to adore it. Yes, that's why. <laughs> Arthur, you loved me once. Yes. And you had asked me to be your wife. Well, that is the natural result of me having loved you. <laughs> and then you threw me over when you saw the poor old Lord Mortlake flirting passionately with me in the conservatory at Kennedy. I'm under the impression my lawyer settled that matter with you under certain conditions dictated by yourself. But at that time, you were rich. I was poor. Quite so. That is why you pretended to love me. Well, you <coughs> silly, Arthur. Lord Mortlake was nothing more to me than an amusement. One of those utterly tedious amusements one only finds in an English country house on an English country Sunday. I don't think anyone morally responsible for what you she does in an English country house. Yes, I know. Many people. Arthur, I loved you. My dear Mrs. Chief, you've always been far too clever to know anything about love. I did love you, and you loved me. You know you loved me. And love is a very wonderful thing, and I suppose that once a man has loved a woman, he would do anything for her except continue to love her? Yes, except that. <laughs> I'm tired of living abroad. I want to come back to London and have a charming house here. Besides, I have reached my romantic stage. When I saw you last night at the Chilterns, I knew that you were the only one I ever cared about, Arthur, if I cared for anyone. And so, on the morning of the day that you marry me, I will give you Robert Chilton's letter. That is my offer. I will give it to you now if you promise to marry me. Now. Tomorrow. Are you, are you quite serious? I'm quite serious. I should make you a very bad husband. Oh, I don't mind. I had two already, and they amused me immensely. Don't you mean you amused yourself immensely? Well, what do you know about my married life? <laughs> Nothing, but I can read it like a book. What book? Book of numbers. Do you think it's quite charming to be rude to a woman in your own house? My dear Mrs. Chief, in the case of truly fascinating women, sex is a challenge, not a defense. I suppose I will take that as a compliment. Then you're going to allow your greatest friend, Robert Chilton, to be ruined, rather than marry someone who has considerable attractions left. You know, Arthur, I thought you would have risen to some great height of self-sacrifice. I think you should, and then you can spend the rest of your life contemplating your own perfections. Oh, I do that as it is. And I think self-sacrifice is a thing that should be put down by law. It's so demoralizing that the person one sacrifices oneself for. They always go to the back. As if anything can demoralize Robert Chilton. You seem to forget that I know his real character. What you know of Robert Chilton is not his real character. It is an act of folly done in his youth. Disgraceful, I admit. Shameful, I admit. Unworthy, I admit. Therefore, not his real character. How do you men stand up for one another? How you women war. I only war against one woman, Gertrude Chilton. I hate her. I hate her now more than ever. Probably because you brought real tragedy into her life. The only real tragedy in a woman's life is the fact that her past is her lover, and the future, invariably, her husband. Lady Chilton knows nothing of the life to which you are. A woman who size glove the seven and three quarters never knows much about anything. Well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview can be regarded as over. You do admit it was romantic, don't you? And for the sake of being your wife, I was ready to surrender a great prize. 
the climax of my diplomatic career. You decline. Very well. If Sir Robert does not uphold my Argentine scheme, I expose him. Why not do? That you must not do. It would be fire, infamous. Don't use such big words. They mean so little. It's a commercial <laughs> transaction. That is all. <coughs> There's no need mixing sentimentality up in all of this. I offer to sell Robert Chilton a certain thing. <coughs> if he doesn't want to pay my price, he will have to pay the world a greater price. There's no more to be said. I must go. Goodbye. Well, won't you shake my hand? No. Your transaction may count as a loathsome commercial transaction of a loathsome commercial age, but you seem to forget that you came here to talk of love. You whose lips desecrated the very world. You went this evening to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in the world, to degrade her husband in her life, <coughs> to put re real poison in her soul, real unhappiness in her life. That I cannot forget. That is unforgettable. You are unjust to me, Arthur. I didn't go to taunt Gertrude at all. I had no idea of the kind when I answered. I called the lady to Markaby simply to find out if an ornament that I had lost had been found at the Chilterns. If you don't believe me, you can ask Lady Markaby. The scene that occurred happened after Lady Markaby had left. And it was really forced upon me by Gertrude's rudeness and sneers. I called a little out of malice, if you like, but to really find out if a diamond brooch of mine had been found. A diamond snake brooch with a ruby. Yes. How did you guess? Because it has been found. In, in point of fact, I found it myself. I foolishly forgot to tell the butler anything about it as I left. Is this it? Yes, it is. I'm so glad to get it back. It was a, a present. Why don't you put it on? Certainly, if you'll pin it in. Why do you put it on as a bracelet? I didn't know it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? Really, but it does look quite charming on me, don't you think? Yeah, it's much better than when I saw it last. When did you see it last? Oh, about ten years ago, on Lady Barcha, from whom you stole it. What do you mean? I mean you stole that ornament from my cousin, Mary Barcha, to whom I gave it in the event of her wedding. Some wretched servant was uh, suspected and sent away in disgrace. I recognized it last night. I determined to hold on to it until I found the thief. I found the thief. And I've heard her very own confession. It is not true. You know it is true. The word thief is written all over your face. I will deny this whole affair from beginning to end. I will say I've never seen this wretched thing, and it's never been in my possession. Yes, you see, the problem with stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheeky, is one never knows how truly wonderful a thing it is that one has stolen. The thing about that brooch is you can't get it off unless you know where the spring is, and I see that you don't. You brute! You coward! Oh. Don't use big words, they mean so little. <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to call for my, my uh, butler. He's an admiral, so he always comes the moment one calls for him. Then I'll ask him to fetch the police. The police? What for? Well, to arrest him. That's what police are for. <laughs> don't. Don't do it. I'll do anything for you. Anything in the world. Give me Robert Children's letter. Stop. <laughs> Let me have time to think. Give me Robert Children's letter. <laughs> I'll give it to you tomorrow. I don't have it with me. You know you are lying. Give me Robert Children's letter. <laughs> Is this it? Yes. You know, Mrs. Cheesy, for such a well-dressed woman, you show moments of admirable common sense. I congratulate you. You promised! I did nothing of the kind. I told you I would bring my servant, and I have. Oh, please say the paroxysm of rage. Mrs. Cheesy, it just highlights yours. Wrinkles. It's not a pleasant sight. <laughs> <laughs> Since Lady's land of the smoking room burnt, it must be obliterated for all eternity. Burnt to a sin, you understand? Yes, my lord. <coughs> and now, Mrs. Cheveley, you won't have the chance to harm Robert Chilton again. If you had the chance, I wouldn't. On the contrary, I intend to render him a great service. Well, I'm charmed to hear it. It's a, it's a reformation. Yes, I can't bear so honorable an English gentleman to be so shamefully deceived and so... Well? I find that somehow that Gertrude Chilton's dying speech and confession has strayed into my pocket. What do you mean? I mean that I am going to send 
Robert Chilton, the love letter his wife wrote to you this evening. The love letter? Yes. I trust you. I need you. I'm coming to you. You wretched Very woman. Very true. Must you always be stealing? I'll have that letter from you by force. I will not leave here until I have Lord Goring Ryan, do you see me out? <clears throat> Good night, Lord Goring. Arthur, 
I never believe a single thing that either you or I say to each other. <laughs> Look, Hemisham, do you think you would make your son behave a little better on occasion, just as a change? My dear young lady, I have absolutely no influence over my son whatsoever. If I had, I know what I would make him do. I'm afraid he's one of those terribly weak natures that is not susceptible to influence. He's heartless. Very heartless. It seems to me I'm a little in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very good for you to be in the way and to know what people say of you behind your back. Oh, I don't like to know at all what people say behind my back. It makes me far too conceited. <laughs> After a line like that, all I can possibly say is a good morning. Please still leave me all alone with Lord Goring, especially at such an early hour in the day. I can't possibly take him with me to Downing Street. It's not the Prime Minister's morning for meeting the unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> People who don't keep their appointments in the park are horrid. Detestable. I'm glad you admit it, but I wish you wouldn't look so pleased about it. <coughs> I can't help it. I'm always pleased when you're around, and Mabel, I've got something particular to say to you. Oh, is it a proposal? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm glad to say it is. I'm so glad. That makes the second today. <laughs> the second today? <laughs> what impertinent ass has been conceited enough to propose to you before I could propose to him? <coughs> Tommy Trafford, of course. Tommy always proposes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> well, I hope you didn't accept it. Of course I didn't accept Tommy. That's why you don't want to it. Of course, as you didn't turn up, I nearly said yes. It would have been an excellent lesson to the both of you if I had. It would have taught you both better manners. Oh, bother Tommy Trafford. He's an ass. I love you. I know. And you might have mentioned it before. I'm sure I've given you heaps of opportunities. You may well to be serious. Ah, that's the sort of thing a man always says to a girl before he has married her. He never says it afterwards. <laughs> Mabel, I, I've told you I love you. Is there no hope that you could love me a little more? Oh, you silly Arthur. If you knew anything about anything, you'd know that I adore you. The whole of London knows that I adore you. I've been going around for the past six months telling everyone in society that I adore you. It is public scandal the way that I adore you. I wonder you will have anything to do with me. I have no character left at all. You know, I was awfully afraid of a refusal. But who would refuse you? You know, Mabel, I'm not nearly good enough for you, and I'm, uh, I'm a little older than 30. <laughs> Younger than that. Um, and, and I'm uh, fearfully extravagant. But so am I, so we're sure to agree. <laughs> and now you must go and wait Gertrude for me. Must I? Yes, I've been waiting all morning to see you the whole world. You mean to say you didn't come here expressly to propose to me? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that is a stroke of genius. Your first. My last. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> if you will pardon the intrusion, Miss Chilton, my lord, her ladyship has now descended from her room. I thought this would be of particular interest in the circumstances. Thank you, Mason. A prescient servant is invaluable, don't you agree? I shall miss Mason when we are married. Oh, perhaps not. I have his identical twin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fall into any temptation while I'm gone. My oh, dear, when you are gone, there are no temptations. It makes me horribly dependent on you. I'll be in the conservatory and at the second palm tree on the left. The second palm tree on the left? Yes. The usual palm tree. Good morning, dear. Oh, my dear. Good morning, Gertrude. How pale you're looking. <laughs> <laughs> Very becoming to you. Good morning, Lady Chilton. Lady Chilton, I have a certain amount of very good news for you. Yesterday evening, Mrs. Cheevey gave me out Robert's letter. <coughs> I burned it. Robert is safe. Safe? Oh, I'm so glad. Oh, what a good friend you are, Jim. It's to us. Yes, there can be now only one person said to be in any danger. Danger? Who is that? Yourself. Why? <coughs> danger? What do you mean? Well, danger is too strong a word, but uh, Lady Chilton, I admit I have something to tell you which might distress you which distresses me terribly. 
you wrote to me yesterday, you wrote a, a beautiful womanly letter to me yesterday, <laughs> in which you asked for help from one of your oldest friends, one of your husband's oldest friends. <coughs> Mrs. Chief, the uh, stole that letter from my rooms. Well, what use is it to her? Why should she not have it? Lady Children, I'll be quite frank with you. Mrs. Cheevey puts a certain construction on that letter and proposes to send it to your husband. Well, what construction could she put on it? Not that. Not that! Are there women so horrible as that? <coughs> and she proposes to send it to my husband. Tell me what happened. Yeah, well, Mrs. Cheevey was concealed in a room adjoining my library, unbeknownst to me. I thought that the woman waiting to see me was yourself. Robert came in unannounced, and while he was there, a chair or something <coughs> fell in the other room. He insisted on going in. I, I couldn't stop him. And he discovered Mrs. Chief, who I still thought was you. There was a terrible scene. Robert left in anger, and at the end of it all, Mrs. Chief, he got hold of the letter. I, I don't know exactly when or how. And what hour did this happen? About half past ten. And now I propose we tell your husband the whole thing. You want me to tell Robert that the woman you expected last night was not Mrs. I think it best you know the exact truth. I couldn't. I couldn't. May I? No. No, the letter must be intercepted. What can I do? Let's arrive right for every moment of the day. His secretary opens them and hands them to him. One <coughs> ten, I'd have the servants to bring me. It wouldn't be impossible. Why did you tell me what to do? Well, pray be calm, Lady Chilton. Lady Chilton, you said that his servants opened all of his letters. Yes. And then Tommy Trafford would do as you told. I think so. And the letter could be opened, it could be recognized without opening it, from the color, I mean. I suppose so. Now, I'll go myself to Tommy Trafford and tell him that at all costs, a letter on pink paper must not be opened by... I trust you, I need you, <laughs> I'm coming to you, Gertrude. Oh, my love, it was not for you to write of coming to me, it was for me to come to you. This letter of yours makes me feel that nothing in the world can help me. You trust me. Yes. You need me. I love you. I do not care what this grace of punishment is in store for me, for me now, but you still love me. There is no disgrace. Mrs. Chilby handed over a document that was in her possession and gave it to Lord Boring, and he has destroyed it. Lord Boring has just told me so. That I'm safe. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to be safe. For two days I have been in terror. How did I destroy my letter? You burned it. How oh, I wish I had seen that one sin of my youth burnt to ash. How many men there are in modern life who would like to see their past burnt to ash before them? <coughs> Is Arthur still here? Yes, he's in the conservatory. I'm so glad now I made that speech last night. I made it thinking that public disgrace might be the result. Public honor has been the result. Oh, I think so. I fear so almost for... Although every proof against me is destroyed, I suppose I should retire from public life. Oh, yes, yes, Robert, you should do that. It is much to surrender. It will be much to gain. And your ambition for me, you used to be ambitious for me. My ambitions? I have none now. You said we two may love each other. It was your ambition that led you astray. Arthur, I don't know how I can repay you. Oh, my dear fellow, I'll tell you so at once. Right at this very moment, under the second palm tree on the left. Lord Caversham. That admirable father of mine really makes a habit of turning up the wrong time. Really. <laughs> ha, ha. Good morning, lady children. Good morning, children. Congratulations on your speech last night. To be the making of you, sir. I have just come from the Prime Minister's office, and he wants you to have the vacant seat in the cabinet. A seat in the cabinet? Yes, and well, you deserve it. You have everything we need in modern public life. High moral, <laughs> high principle, high character. Everything you've not got and never will have. <laughs> I don't like principles, Father. I prefer <coughs> principles. A seat in the cabinet. Uh. <laughs> no. 
I'm afraid I cannot accept this offer, Lord Caversham. I have made up my mind to decline it. Decline it, sir? I am going to retire from public life at once. Decline it and retire from public life? I never heard so much damn nonsense in all my born day. Oh, I do beg your pardon. <laughs> children. <laughs> children. Don't grin like that. <laughs> Lady Sheldon, you're the most intelligent woman in the whole of London. Can't you stop your husband from making a complete... Couldn't you make him see there? Could you do something? I think my husband is quite right in this determination, Lord Caversham. I approve of it. You approve of it? Good. Uh, I admire him. I've never admired him so much before. He's finer than even I thought him. But you will go and write your letter to the Prime Minister now, won't you? Don't hesitate about it, Robert. Yeah, I, I suppose I'd better write that letter at once. I will have to ask you to excuse me, Lord Coversham. I will come Something wrong here? What's the matter with this family? There's <coughs> what's called nowadays a high moral tone, Father, that's all. Oh, I hate these highfalutin new words. You used to call it idiocy 50 years ago. Well, I'm not going to stay in this house with no talker. Oh, just come in here a second, Father. The, uh, the third palm tree on the left, the usual palm tree. The what? The conservatory, Father. Uh, there's somebody there I'd like you to talk to. What about? About myself. Not a subject on which much eloquence is required. <laughs> <coughs> Lady Children, why are you playing Mrs. Cheaply's palm? You. Mrs. Cheapy came here in an attempt to ruin your husband, either to drive him, her, him from public life or to in some dishonorable position. From the latter tragedy you saved him, why are you now trusting the former upon him? Why are you doing him the evil that she tried to do? I'm sorry. Lady Children, you, you wrote to me yesterday evening, you wrote to me saying you trusted me and you needed my help. Now is when you really need to trust my judgment. You love Robert. Do you want to crush his love for you? What sort of a life will Robert lead if you, if you take from him the fruits of his ambition and, and take from him the splendor of a great political career? But it is Robert himself who wants to retire from public life. It was he who first said so. Rather than lose your love, Robert would do anything. He is, he is making for you a terrible sacrifice. Take my advice, Lady Children. Do not accept a sacrifice so great. We are not worthy of accepting such sacrifice. <coughs> and besides, I have been punished enough. You've both been punished. I set him up too high. Well, don't for that very reason throw him down now too low. If Robert has fallen from his altar, don't drive him now into the mire. Failure to Robert would be the very mire of shame. Power is his passion. He would lose everything. He would even lose the power to feel love. Lady Chilton, Robert's life, Robert's love, is in your hands at this moment. Don't mar both for him. <coughs> Gertrude, here is the draft of my letter. Shall I read it out to you? Let me see it. What are you doing? <coughs> we will not spoil a life for you. You will see you spoil it as a sacrifice for me, a useless sacrifice. We are not made to accept such sacrifices from each other, and we are not worthy of them. I've just learned this and much else from Lord Goring. Gertrude. You can forget, and I forgive. Arthur, it seems to me that I've always to be in your debt. Oh, my dear fellow, no, your debt is to Robert, to Lady Chilton, not to me. Oh, I owe you much. And now tell me what you were going to ask me just now as Lord Cowardson came in. Robert, you are you are your sister's guardian, and, and I would like to ask your hand your consent to her hand in marriage. Oh, you're so good! Thank you, Lady Chilton. <laughs> My sister to be your wife. Yes. I'm very sorry, Arthur, but the thing is quite out of the question. I have to think of Mabel's future happiness, and I don't think her happiness would be safe in your hands. And I cannot have her. <laughs> sacrificed? Yes, utterly sacrificed. There's one thing worse than an absolutely loveless marriage. A marriage where there's Love on one side only, and one heart sure to be broken. But I love Mabel. There's no other woman who has a place in my life. No, but if they love each other, why should they not be married? Arthur cannot give Mabel the love she deserves. 
What reason have you got to say such a thing? Do you really require me to tell you? Certainly I do. As you choose. When I found a call on you yesterday evening, I found Mrs. Chiefly concealed in your room. It was between 10 and 11 o'clock at night. I do not wish to say anything more. <laughs> your relations with Mrs. Chiefly have, as I've said to you last night, of course, nothing to do with me whatsoever. I know you were engaged to be married to her once, and the fascination she exercised over you seems to have returned. You spoke to me of her as a woman pure and stainless, a woman you respected and honored. That may be so, but I cannot give my sister's life into your hands. It would be wrong of me. It would be unjust, infamously unjust. I have nothing more to say. Robert, it was not Mrs. Chiefly whom Lord Coring expected last night. Not Mrs. Chiefly? Who was it then? Then you chose me. <coughs> it was your own wife. Robert, yesterday afternoon,